four, three, two, one. <clears throat> Good afternoon, this is John Bennett from Neurosurgical TV in Miami. Today we have the extreme pleasure of having a top skull base surgeon from Brazil, Luis Borba. And we have uh, one of the largest turnouts we've had, but uh, let's first introduce everyone to Luis. Uh, hello, Abraham. Unmute yourself and say hello to Luis. Hello, Dr. Bennett. I'm Ibrahim, a resident uh, on, in the uh, Federal Center of Neurosurgery in Tayman, Tayman is the city of Rush. Uh, uh, he's in Tayman, uh, where Dr. Sufianov is. Yes, yes, yeah. Dr. Okay, Isaac, are you there? Isaac, uh, are you there, Isaac? Maybe not, maybe you stepped away. Hector, are you there? Hector, come on, Hector. <laughs> Well, Hector stepped away too. Jeff, are you there? Mm, no luck. How about you, Stuart? I know you're there. I can see your picture. Go ahead, Lewis. I mean, uh, Stuart, go ahead, Stuart. Go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm John Norisoldi, Stuart Portilla. Uh, I work in Cuenca, Ecuador. In Cuenca, in the mountains in the background. Hola, Stuart. Ah, ¿Cómo está? ¿Todo bien? Bien. Muy bien. Gracias. Podemos hablar en español. Entendemos bien nosotros. Aprendiendo de los grandes. Bien, gracias, bien. gracias. Vamos. Ah, Vamos a conversar un poquito acá. Ah, Let's talk a little bit. Por... <laughs> Salud. Ok, present. Present. Could you please present yourself to Luis? Ok, present. Are you there? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, myself, Dr. Prashant. I'm a neurointensivist from India. Neurointensivist of India, welcome. Ashish, Hello, Ashish, are you there? Ashish, are you there? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Ashish. I'm from, uh, I'm a neurosurgery resident from Mumbai. This is the hospital background that Mr. That, very good. There's the background. That's excellent. Okay, welcome. Oh, big. Hello, hello. Big hostel. Uh, nice. yeah, it Very looks nice. like that. Uh, yeah. uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Boba. I've heard a lot about, about you. Sir. Okay, very good. Vinod, could you please introduce yourself? Go ahead, Vinod. Uh, hi, John. Just a minute. Uh, okay, uh, there you go. They get the light. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, Louis. I'm uh, Dr. Vinod Felix. I'm an oh, ABS hello. surgeon. Uh, I do endoscopy skull based surgeries. I am put up in Kerala, a southernmost part of India. I have seen uh, those videos, very nice videos. Con congratulations. I have seen your, your, your paper. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Welcome, Vinod and Serge. Yeah? Go ahead, Serge. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Professor Boba. Yeah, it's such a such a pleasure to be here. I'm a final year resident from Cameroon. Currently uh, doing my residency in Zimbabwe. Okay, welcome, Serge. Adnan, Adnan, please please introduce yourself. Go ahead, Adnan. My name is yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Nan Kazim. I'm from Pakistan, and uh, very happy to hear all of the famous neurosurgeons of the world, especially Luis Borba. Saludos, uh, Senor Luis Borba. Yo puedo hablar español también. Los saludos sí, bueno, para bueno. Stuart también. Y he escuchado mucho sobre ustedes eh, desde mis profesores acá. Es muy famoso el Scalbe Sergeant. Muchos gracias. saludos para todo el mundo. Okay. Gracias, gracias. Welcome, gracias. Adnan. Uh, Abraham. Hello, Dr. John. Hello, Dr. Borba. I'm glad to meet you. Hi, Hello everyone, uh, I'm Ibrahim, medical student and PhD student in neuroscience in Berlin. Berlin, welcome. Hey. And Simon, the main man. Um, uh, hello, Dr. Borber, thank yes. you very much for presenting here today. Um, I lived in Japan for 30 years, California 14, but I'm from England, uh, psychologist and now medical student and worked with Dr. Bennett for a long time. Looking forward to presentation today, thank you. Hey, welcome, he's the main editor. Okay, Khalif, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Khalif. I'm from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a fourth year resident in the College of Surgeons, College of 
surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa, and I'm based in Aga Khan University Hospital, Nairobi. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Well, well, welcome, Khalif, and thank you, Dr. Bobra, for coming, and yes, it's all yours. Thank you. It's all yours. Thank you, thank you. Okay, let's try. First of all, I thank John for the opportunity to be here. It is a great pleasure to me. I, I speak in my broken English. It's the official language in the world, you see? If you understand, I speak, you see? And I'll try to share my presentation will be about the learn uh, have in skull based surgery in the last 25 years. I don't know if you can see. It's okay? Yes, it's fine. Okay. This is a hospital I work in the University Hospital, uh, Federal University, in Evangelical Hospital in, in Curitiba, is south of Brazil. It's a city with around 3 million habitants and a very nice city. You have people from around the world. You'll be very welcome to come here to have a nice barbecue, a nice wine, and a good surgery and learn uh, something about it. My history is called based surgery, totally dedicated to, to my mentor, Professor Samal Mefti. I spent three years of my life from 93 to 96 in Real Rock, Dr. Mefti. I was the first fellow of Dr. Mefti in the research. I had the opportunity to start the lab during three years as they working in the lab in the microsurgery, especially in training cadaver dissection. I strongly believe that the neurosurgeon and the skull based surgery is made in the lab. If you go to the lab, you don't learn the most important thing that skull based surgery is the microsurgical anatomy. If you talk about meningioma, meningioma is a, is a passion for all neurosurgeons around the world. Harvey Cushing will say that one of the most gratifying things in, the, in neurosurgery is the radical removal of meningioma with neurological preservation. You can get a patient with a large tumor, you remove the tumor, you cure the patient. It's a great thing for our doctors to cure, to do better for the patient. Today, we have seen so many things that's going around the world, new techniques, new, uh, new material, new uh, machine. And sometimes the meningioma treatment is get a different way that is the, the, the best way to do it. When I start, meningioma was meningioma. Meningioma was a benign lesion. Okay, remove the meningioma and go. After we start to study, you see to have the grade one meningioma that almost 90% of the case, a grade two meningioma that is a typical meningioma, a the grade three meningioma, the, 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 the malignant meningioma. And the behavior in the follow-up of this patient, that should be completely different. In grade one meningioma, the total removal is the goal, not just only the tumor, but the bone in the dura round. In the grade two, we always have to try the total removal, but always we have to think that there is a great possibility that this tumor come back. This situation, maybe, maybe you can plan a post-operative radiation therapy. In some situations, if you cannot remove totally the tumor, it's imperative to give post-operative radiation therapy. For grade three meningioma, a malignant meningioma, is very bad tumor. Despite to have a very radical removal, remove the dura, remove the bone, the tumor will come back. So it's very important to understand what you want to plan to treat meningioma. The only thing that you can see during this time is that the great majority of the tumor are multicentrical. This is one point when you talk about approaches, minimally invasive approaches. Minimally invasive approach means removal of the mass of minimally invasive. But if you study, if you study the meningioma, you see that in 90% of the case, there is a baby around, there is the big mass, and there is a babe around. You have to remove the mess, but also you have to remove the mess. This babe around there, we're having more than 96% of the case. We remove the main mess, the, but always there is, is small needles, nodules of tumor, one to three centimeters from the mess. Because this is very important to think that surgery for meningioma is not totally limited to remove of the mass. 
who have to remove the dura, who have to remove the bone, and maximum that you can get the dura around. When you have a convex stimen in Joma, sometimes you can do this. But in skull-based surgery, it's very difficult to get this kind of removal. But at least you have to try. The modern treatment of meningioma is remove of the bone that during many, many years you talk about the in invasion of the meningioma was not a, just a reaction, was not invasion of, by the tumor, or just a reaction of the bone. Today you know that this reaction that you have around the tumor, the hyperostosis that you used to call, is tumor invasion. If it's tumor invasion, you have to remove this bone. Also, the dura is very important to remove because you know that the recurrence occurs two to three centimeters from the main mass and also remove the tumor. You have to know what kind of the tumor you are treating, grade one, grade two, grade three. You have to do cytogenetic studies. It's very important to do the sex energy studies because if you do this, you can know the behavior of the tumor. You can also study the proliferative index to see how the speed of growth of the tumor. In one thing that I always, when talk about meningioma, say is the hormonal expression, expression, the estrogen and progesterone. And we know today that if the tumor has positive for estrogen, the prognosis in the follow-up in recurrence is higher when you have positive for progesterone. One thing that I, you can make a correlation, meningioma is like the benign version of breast cancer. The theology is like similar hormonal expression. And the behavior also is similar. When you have a meningioma in men, the prognosis is worse than the women. The same happen with breast cancer. It's important to know this correlation and to know the expression. In the very interest on, on, on it is that the treatment of progesterone does not work. But it means that you, you, you have the prognosis, but not the treatment when you have the hormonal expression. The other thing that you learned in the entire life is the natural history of disease. This patient, 35 years old female, just headache, no lower cranial nerve deficit, no facial palsy, no hearing loss. This patient had just headache. If I do the surgery, in this case, this patient will wake up with lower cranial nerve deficit, maybe facial palsy. In a natural history of this tumor, sometimes is more benign than you imagine. Asymptomatic patient, sometimes you have to wait to see how be the behavior. And sometimes this on plaque meningioma, you can control, you see what's going on. Intracarbonous meningioma. If you see a tumor like this one you have here in 2003, 2010, same tumor, same tumor. The patient is still asymptomatic. If you go to many, many places, they are sending this patient to radio surgery. If you go to some place, they do surgery. If you go to another place, they do surgery and radio surgery. If you just control this tumor, you know what's happened? Just observation, is in Portuguese, okay? Observation, 70% of control in eight years. Radiation therapy, radio surgery, 8% of control in eight years. If you wait and see if the tumor will grow, it's to talk about cavernosinus meningioma, 45% of control. It means that we are doing surgery, we are sending to radiation therapy the tumor that will not grow. It's very important when you treat any kind of the lesion to know the natural history of the disease. You are not surgery, of, you are not doctors of surgery. We are doctors of people. How to treat the pathology 
he understand the pathology is the most important thing to, to, to do it. This another lady came to me with a headache. What they need this lady? Go home. Maybe see the ophthalmologist. If you start to have decrease of the vision, you can do the peeling of the middle fossa, decompress the opt nerve, and leave this small piece inside the covenant signs. But if the patient is asymptomatic, there is no visual deficit. This patient don't need treatment. It's just, just to follow the patient. We know, we know that radiation therapy works for meningioma. Of course it works. If you have a speed of growth with radiation therapy, it decreases. It will be slowly. See, the tumor will start to grow slowly. Because cut out the vascularization. But the chief cell, the real cell, who is still alive, it starts to grow slowly. And maybe, maybe can change the behavior. The great majority of patients that we see that we treat with radiotherapy, any kind of radiotherapy, you see like this. Pre-radiation, pro-radiation, a little change, just a little bit. Maybe it is the natural history or radiation effect. If you know that the natural history, 70% of the cavernocyte meningioma is grows very slow, maybe it's time to wait and see what you can do. It. Remember, it's very rare. It's very rare. But meningioma can be induced by radiation therapy. Meningioma can uh, treat it with radiation, of course. Can be induced malignant transformation. There is this meningioma you call radiation induced. This meningioma is one of the worst meningioma to treat. After the Second War, when the Jewish people was coming back to Israel with a lot of disease, sometimes with tinea, was very difficult to treat. In that time, they used low doses, very, very low doses of radiation. Very low doses. Was the treatment that time? It was perfect. That time was perfect. What's happened? After many years, we start to see this meningioma, radiation-induced meningioma. Very aggressive, very aggressive, and very difficult to treat. If you saw a patient with medulloblastoma, ependymomas, some tumors that you treat radiation therapy, after many, many years, radiation-induced meningioma. Let's give the treatment the correct treatment, the correct time for the correct patient. It's the most important life. We are doctors, not only treating disease. What makes me nervous if you go to the most important or the biggest, not, not so the most important, but the largest meeting in the world? The North American, the American, skull, uh, not skull base, the the ANS, you see the advertisement in the leg cell gamma knife. This is small tumor treating with radiation therapy, giving radio surgery for this tumor. This tumor is the dream of all neurosurgeons. To remove this tumor is the dream of all neurosurgeons. You cannot sell to our people one treatment that's not curable when you have one treatment that is curable. I will show you one very similar case. Look at this case. Tentorium, meningioma. The attachment of the tumor, very small. Posterior fossa, okay? Retro sigma approach, very classical approach. Everybody in any part of the world can do it. You can come here, 
cut the tentorium, cut the attachment of the tumor, and the ball will be here. See, you can continue the, the, the surgery and see that this tumor that was indicated to radio surgery, you can come back here and see that the tumor is completely free without any, any damage. And the patient in sitting position, the cerebellum come down and show the area that you can move. This patient is cured. Don't need radiation, don't need any kind of treatment. Sometimes you need, sometimes you don't need. The best treatment of meningioma is the radical total removal of the tumor, the dura, and the area that's infected. You see the patient in the, in the post-op and the retro sick incision was made. Okay, what's the strategy to treat meningioma? This is the strategy for skull base. First, deep knowledge of anatomy. You need to know anatomy very, very well. The surgical anatomy. Where you learn the surgical anatomy? In the lab. Go to the cadaver, dissect, dissect, dissect. I spent three years of my life in the lab. Training, 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 dissecting, dissecting, dissecting. Doing courses, doing courses. But when I was going back home, I went to the anatomical lab and do the dissection. This anatomical lab, anatomical dissection, you can do in any part of the world. You don't need to go to the best lab in the world to have a very nice dissection, very nice uh, head, very nice injection, and you see the red, the blue. If you go to the anatomy department of your university, that old cadaver, the anatomy will be there. It's to learn, it's to save patients. Second thing, you need to expose this surgical approach you have to understand. Sometimes you need minimal, sometimes you need maximum. It does not mean that in every case you need maximum. It does not mean that in every case you can do with minimum. You have to know minimum and maximum. The technology will help you a lot. The intraoperative monitoring, neural navigation, endoscopy, it will help you, of course. But it's not the most important thing. But it can help you and improve your results. The microsurgical technique that Professor Yasha Gil taught you during many, many years, it's the way. Go to the lab, train microsurgery, do small surgeries with microscope, do a lumbar disc with microscope, drain a hematoma, intracerebral hematoma with microscope. Maybe you don't need, but you train, you learn microsurgery. The microsurgery has to be your entire life, your entire day. And the last you call the x-ray view. What x-ray view? If you have a tumor in the tentorial area, close to the third nerve, okay? If you, in the anatomy, the third nerve is in the same position. In surgery, the third nerve will be in different position. How you know the third nerve? How you find the third nerve? The third nerve? And to know some points that are fixed. We know that the third nerve is go in the superior wall of the cavernous sinus, in the trigonal of, of the third nerve. You find the third nerve there. This I call the X ray view. Go to the point where you know that is the nerve, where it's fixed. There, you orientate yourself in the whole area. Meningioma is arachnoid root. Sorry. Meningioma is arachnoid surgery. It's different when you do aneurysm surgery. When you do aneurysm surgery, you dissect the vessel, vessel by vessel. In meningioma, you dissect the arachnoid. The arachnoid go to the vessel and you take the tumor out. Why I say that's underwater? Because sometimes you have a plane that you cannot see very well. If you irrigate 
you pull a little bit the tumor, you dissect the tumor laterally, you see the arachnoid, you put some irrigation, the plants start to come. That separate the tumor, the nerves, and the brain. Try to save the vein. I always try. At least try. <laughs> Not always I can get, but try. Because you never know what's happening with veins. Sometimes you have a big vein, you damage the vein, nothing's happening. Sometimes you have a small tributary vein, have a big hematoma, venous infarct. Try. Don't coagulate the vein before try to preserve. It's one thing that's very important in many angioma surgery. Let me show this case here. Today is a controversy. Huh? You can remove from for, for the nose. It's perfect. You can do for the nose. Perfect. You can do for the head. Perfect. How can I do? Which one is better? Both are possible. Which one is better? If you understand the pathology, you see that you can reach the tumor from the nose. But this baby tumor that you talk in the, uh, when we start the lecture, sometimes you cannot see. So you, when you try to do the surgery through the nose, you can close the CSF leak. Now is, is just the level is okay. There is no too much CSF leak when you have when they start. Okay? You can close, you can do a very, very nice job from below. You can remove this small tumor from the nose very nicely. But you also can remove through the head. It's microsurgery. You have the flap, you have the microsurgery. The microsurgery is our entire life. We learn neurosurgery, we learn microsurgery. What's wrong with the microsurgery if you treat the brain carefully? What's wrong with this? What's the difference in this, this two technique? When you go through the nose, maybe there is babies around the dura that you cannot see from the nose. When you go for the cranial, you remove the tumor, you remove the area, you remove the dura, you remove the bone also. And the baby tumor that you sometimes you see here around, and sometimes around the octal nerve, sometimes it's there, you can see nicely. And microsurgery is our entire life. I'm not, I'm not against the removal of this tumor through the nose. But you have to be honest with us. When you do from below, you remove the bone, of course. You remove the dura, of course. But this theory, that's the nodules, is around the tumor, like this here, one to three centimeters from the mass, you cannot see from the nose. You talk about curable approach for microsurgery, you talk about possible curable approach from the nose. It's the truth. You can do it both ways, but different way to treat and to see the pathology. I go for two areas. One area, the petrochival area, the one of the most controversial area. How to reach? You see today, many, many people say, I do everything by retro sigmoid approach. The other guy come there and say, no, I need Petro's approach for everybody. Another guy came and said, no, I do for the nose. Don't need incision. What's the problem? We need to understand the pathology. We want to understand the disease. We want to understand the behavior of the tumor. If you want to be skull-based surgery, we need to know retro sigmoid approach. You need to know posterior petrosal approach. You need to learn the anterior petrosal approach. And you decide if the best approach for that situation, not the best approach for you, is the best approach for the case, for the patient. 
I strongly, be I strongly believe that meningioma is an intradural lesion in need intradural approaches. It's my, my concept. But if you want to go to the nose and remove partially, the great majority of the times, petroclival tumor, when you come from the nose, remove partially. Maybe old patient, it's okay. But don't tell the patient they are doing a curable approach. Just tell the truth. I decompress the brain stem, the surgery will be okay. Okay, but not cure the patient. When you go to China, you see Professor Zhang, 1546 petroclavular area meningioma. In almost 50% of the case, he used transpetrosal approach, anterior transpetrosal approach, or posterior transpetrosal approach. It means the petrosal approach is not that. The petrosal approach you have to learn. Between petrosal approach, maybe we, you need. Sometimes you need, sometimes you don't need. Because this is important to understand the anatomy. In the anatomy show how to reach this. The anterior petros approach, you can remove the tumor, you expose the petros apex, okay? And sometimes you can take, just one second here. Oh, it's okay. I'm trying to find a pointer. It can, it can show the, the pointer. Good. In the left side here, so the peeling of the middle fossa, expose the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, go to the petrous apex, and liberate totally the fifth nerve. I call the anterior petrous approach the fifth nerve approach. Why fifth nerve approach? Because the fifth nerve has to be totally liberated. If it's totally liberated, okay, you can take the tumor, and remove medially and lateral to the, to the fifth nerve. In the anterior petros approach, you liberate the fifth nerve, but the limitation of the anterior petros approach is the internal auditory meatus. If the tumor is under the internal auditory meatus, you cannot, you, you cannot, you cannot uh, reach the tumor through the anterior petros approach. The, pe the best case for this is tumor like this. Locating this area here in the petros in the petros apex, anterior part of the petroclavial area, you come in this direction, remove the petros apex, and expose everything. See, and the fifth nerve in this situation was displaced inferiorly. You see, when you remove this, you have this option of this. In this situation here, you see, in the pre op. This route you reach the tumor. This you call anterior petros approach. There is another situation that the tumor is in the petros area. Oh, you see, oh, in this case we need petros approach. But if you see the main attachment of the tumor is in the can you hear me? Yes. The, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. The main attachment of the tumor is in the posterior fossa. If the main attachment of the tumor is posterior fossa, I don't need to do the petrosal approach. In this situation, you can do. Oh my God. You can do a simple retro sigmoid approach and dispose the area. See, the main attachment was here. Here's the lower cranial nerves. Here's the vertebral artery, the main attachment of the tumor. How to decide the approach for petroclival area? You decide the approach when you know where is the attachment of the tumor. If the attachment of the tumor is posterior to the canal, you do a retrosigmoid approach. Sometimes in the petros area, but it's not superior to, to the tentorium, you can come do retro sigma approach. See the same situation, pre and post-op, we did a simple retro sigma approach. 
tumor that looks like you need a big approach, you don't need this. Let me tell you, in more than 70% of the case of skull-based tumor, you can remove with two approaches, pteron approach and the retro sigmoid approach. But it does not mean that the need to know the other approach. Sometimes you need cranial orbitals hegomatic, sometimes you need petrosal, sometimes you need uh, transcondylar. You need to know the situation that you, you need it to. This is a case, let's say, oh, this patient has trigeminal neuralgia. What kind of approach is this? You can do by retro sigmoid approach, of course. You come with retro sig, you see the porum of the fifth nerve, the fifth nerve will be here. You open the poro trigeminalis, you see the tumor in the middle fossa. Or some people say, oh, this part in the middle fossa you cannot remove because it is in the cavernal sinus. If you see the anatomy, this tumor is not in the cavernal sinus. This tumor is located in the Meckel's case. In this situation, you can use Petro's approach or you can use retro sigma approach. Sigma, the retro sigma approach, then the approach will be more limited. The Petro's approach will have more expansion. You, you use the one that you believe to be more comfortable and the patient have better exposure of the tumor. To decide is the most important thing. In this situation, what we did, we did the start of retro seek, you did the petrosal approach, work anterior and posterior to the sigmoid sinus. See, it's the left side, okay? And the fifth nerve, you see, from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa. In the area that you think that was in the cavernal sinus was not in the cavernal sinus, was in the macro scale. It's important to know the anatomy of the tumor and the behavior of the tumor. If the tumor is located in the posterior part of the cavernal sinus, sometimes it's not in the cavernal sinus. It's located only in the retro C. It's the basilar artery. You see the arachnoid there? You preserve the arachnoid for the vessels. You don't dissect the arachnoid to, to the tumor. See? The basilar here, the brainstem here, the third nerve, the contralateral third nerve. You see all this area by subtemporal, Petrosal, press sigmoid, retro sigmoid. When you do the approach, you have all the views that you need. You need many options to reach the tumor. This is the pre op, the post op. See? In the cavernal sinus here. Many people say, oh, just remove this part, give you radio surgery for this part. But this part is not in the cavernal sinus, in the Meckel's cave here. You can remove the see, see the fifth nerve. The fifth nerve was here, very small see. Here you can see the whole fifth nerve. Pre and the pass up with preservation of the motor uh, motility, ocular motility. See? What possibility to do this? The planning, the surgical planning. How is you do surgery? How you do everything? You need planning. If you don't do planning, you don't do the correct way. You have a situation like this one. It's a big petroclival meningioma. The attachment is not only in the petrosal. The attachment also is in the clivus. It's anterior to the clivus. If it is anterior to the clivus, you cannot reach with the red sigmoid approach. You have difficulties. Maybe you can reach, but to be more difficult, and say, and maybe you need to leave some tumor. You know that the best way to treat meningioma is the radical total removal, of course, with the preservation of neurological structures. Okay, what it makes difficult the many skull based meningioma is not the tumor by itself, it's the relation of the tumor of the brain stem. If you lose the plane, if the T2 is white in the brain stem. It means that it is invasion of the pia mater. If you have invasion of the pia mater, independent of the approach, if you do it, you not get. And the complications are related because of this interface between brain stem 
and tumor. See, the approach help you, but to make the difference is this one. In this situation, there is no edema in the brain stand. It's very nice plan. You can do, you can remove the tumor. For this, you need approach. You need expose. How to learn Petro's approach? Not in the patient. You have to go to the lab. The temporal bone, if you have a very nice ENT, that work together, you want to do surgery together, it's a good sign. They can do the mastoidectomy for you. But we, as a neurosurgeon, we need to know temporal bone. We need to know our approach. I spent three years in the lab doing dissection of the temporal bone. We have a course around the world of temporal bone. Temporal bone is the only surgery, is the only dissection that it reproduces. What you do in the lab is the same thing that you do in surgery. Do you know why? Because it's bone. It's the same bone in the cadaver, it's the same bone in the lab, it's the same bone in the surgery. If you learn in the, in the lab, you reproduce. If you go slowly, you identify the structure. When you do the anterior, the petro, posterior petros approach, or petros approach, as the people call, the space that the press sigmoid area is very small. When you get the space, when you identify the sigmoid sinus, you cut the tentorium and displace posterior. Because this, you need a craniotomy in the posterior fossa also. Press sigmoid in the post sigmoid. This you can displace the sigmoid side. When you work subtemporal, press sigmoid, and sometimes re retro sigmoid have many roots to reach the area. Let's see a case like this, very similar to the other one. How to reach this? You do the petrous approach. You can go around the tumor. Here's the labyrinthine, here's the five. Is the nerve, is the basilar, have all the reach here, going around the base of the skull. And you work parallel to the base of the skull. See, you don't need work in this direction. You work here, like V, you see? Here's the labyrinthine, okay? Here's the left side, okay? You work like this. If you do this, you can get a nice removal and preserve the function. This patient had a sixth nerve in the, in the, in the pre-op. After surgery was worse, the sixth nerve. And very interesting, that's the case that the patient wake up to sixth nerve like this, in the midline. I always we say, when the sixth is in the midline, there is no, how um, say, uh, estrabismus. You will recover. This patient didn't recover. I think what's happened, had ischemia or infarct of the nerve in the follow-up. She needs surgery, uh, ophthalmological surgery to, to, to help here. But this is the price for curable removal or radical removal. This patient had a tumor like this that you lose her life. Now, she has no tumor. She has an estrabismo. Okay. Is a high price to save the life? If you talk to the patient, if you talk to the family, explain what you can do, maybe if they accept this for save their life. Sometimes you have the fourth nerve. Fourth nerve is the worst. It's always in the middle. It's very small. I will say a joke that the fourth nerve is in the beginning of the surgery. You take the picture, show the fourth nerve. When you finish the, sur the surgery, sometimes you don't see it. But it's the same situation. Large tumor. The fourth nerve is in the border of the tentorium. If you damage the fourth nerve, maybe you damage, maybe not. But if you damage, it's a high price to remove this tumor and save a life, talk to the patient, explain how you can do it. The best treatment 
it has to be decided with the patient, with the family. See, neurosurgery is not a game so easily. Neurosurgery is a game that has to be compartily in between you, the patient, the family, and the best for them. There are situations like this guy came to me with diplopia. Did you see? They had two tumors. One in the petrous apex area is more in the tentorial, and one in the, in the foramen magna. What's happened in this situation here? I try to remove, I remove totally the superior, but the inferior part of the tumor that was going inside the jugular foramen, I couldn't remove. Yeah, if, if I try to remove these tumors, inside the jugular foramen, meningioma, not glomus, glomus is different, meningioma, that they, there was no plane between the lower cranial nerves and this tumor. The patient will wake up with deficits of the lower cranial nerves. An acute, acute deficit of the lower cranial nerves is a complication that is very devastating. See? In this situation, I prefer to leave one small piece of tumor and follow. Maybe I send to radio surgery, maybe you wait because it's compensate of the other side, start to have the deficit and slowly, and the other side, one side compensate the other side, it is slowly. Maybe you can compensate it, or maybe you send to radio surgery if it start to grow, or maybe. If they compensate, you come back and remove the tumor. I don't know how, how long time have, I spoke too much already. Maybe it's another area, it's cavernous signing region. I can talk a different uh, webinar. And John, what I think I can stop here and whatever, discuss. Whatever you want, Lewis. Yeah. I have more one hour. <laughs> For okay. me, it's pick the whole, whole, whole. Let's go a little bit higher. Uh, it's fa faster here. Okay. There is another area that you call cavernocyte meningioma. This was a no man land many years ago. After came, uh, everybody land. Everybody was going there. What's happened? Many patients wake up with motility problem. Many surgeries, deformity, morbidity. When the time that you learn the, the anatomy, you understand how is the behavior of this tumor. Sometimes these meningioma are totally in their lateral wall. But you can clean the cavernous sinus, you clean the lateral wall. Sometimes the tumor is inside the cavernous sinus and the main attachment is inside the cavernous sinus. Sometimes you cannot get. Sometimes you have situation like this. In the left side, you see the anatomy. In the, the right side, you see the surgery. You can clean well and preserve the nerve. But it's not always the rule. It's possible to remove cavernous sinus meningioma? It's possible. Inside the cavernous sinus, it's possible. But sometimes it can happen like this. You do the surgery, you remove the tumor, you identify the artery, we identify the nerve, you preserve the anatomy, you preserve all the structure, and the post op the patient is like this. Never will be the same. When you go there, never will be the same. And you, you know now that the natural history of this is most lesion here is more benign than you imagine. Maybe a conservative surgery, remove this, just liberate the optic nerve, maybe the option. Sometimes you have a patient like this, that the tumor make the approach for you. The patient is complete of stomoplegic, you can remove the tumor, the patient will be the same deficit she had before. In another situation like this, the tumor is in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. I have seen a lot of papers that people talk about cavernous sinus meningioma, removal of cavernous sinus meningioma. This tumor is not in the cavernous sinus, it is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. The nerve is preserved. See, 
The anatomy shows me here that the tumor is outside the cavernous site. It's not the fetus say. Sometimes you do a surgery just to decompress the nerves. Liberate the optic nerve, unilateral, bilateral. See, has this small tumor here, bilateral tumor. You remove this mass, liberate the optic nerve in this situation here. You save the vision, but leave this part lateral here. You have situations you need to do just biopsy to do the diagnosis. Maybe inflammatory disease, maybe cancer, maybe meningioma. In small lesions located in such areas, sometimes it's possible to remove. See this tumor here? It's called the Parkinson triangle. The tumor was totally located here. You open this. I did the surgery to do a biopsy because I was thinking it was cancer. See? Because a patient has no pain, see, but there is a small tumor located in the Parkinson triangle. In this situation, you can go inside the cavernous sinus, you can remove the tumor. But it's not the rule. This situation is like this, you remove a small piece, you can preserve it. What's the biggest problem of the cavernous sinus? The superior orbital fissure. If the tumor involves the superior orbital fissure, it's impossible to remove. In my, in my hand, it's involved totally the nerve. In my hand, it's impossible to remove the tumor without deficit of the lower kernel nerve. What I'm doing now, I'm doing the peeling of the middle fossa, decompress of the cavernous sinus, removing the posterior wall, but leaving this anterior wall here. In this anterior wall, uh, the anterior part, sorry, the anterior part. This part will leave, because if you do this, you have a problem. You have a case like this, you remove the tumor, you did the peeling of the middle fossa, V2, V3, superior orbital fissure, opt nerve, carotid artery, third nerve, I know that there is tumor here. I leave this small part of the tumor and preserve the function. Same situation like this, you remove the tumor and leave this part in the superior orbital fissure. If you leave this part here, you preserve the motility. If you try to remove this, you lose completely the motility. And many, many times you not cure the patient. In petroclival meningioma, you remove the tumor in this area, the third nerve, sorry, the third nerve or the fourth nerve may be in the field, but you cure the patient. Here, you're not cured, and your patient will wake up with complete ophthalmoplegia and pitosis. It's terrible for the patient, terrible for the patient. This morbi morbidity, I don't agree. To end, I have to say cavernosinus meningioma is possible to remove, but to pay a price. The price, you lose the motility of some nerves, and special nerve will be the same. The superior orbital fissure is the main limitation of the surgery. Secondary vision, it means the tumor is coming from outside to inside the cavernous sinus, displacing the cavernous sinus. You can get it. But the most important lesson in cavernous sinus meningioma the cavernous sinus meningioma, the great majority of the time, are asymptomatic. If they are asymptomatic, you should just observe and follow with visual field. Maybe this patient needs only the compression of the optic nerve. And you don't advocate radio surgery for unproved tumor growth or regrowth. Just when the tumor starts to grow again, we documentate that the tumor is growing, that you cannot remove, or the morbidity to be very high. In this situation, you send to radio surgery. Skull basic like this is training, training, training. Go to the lab. We are doing course around the world. The here is in Fort Worth, is in Siberia. Now in October, we have our sixth course. Six years we are going there. 
we are doing live surgery, cadaver dissection, lectures. It's good. You stay the whole one week with Professor Sufyanov there. Like uh, inside 100% neurosurgery, I say. It's a course in 100% neurosurgery. It's like the Disney World of Neurosurgery, the Institute of Professor Sufyanov. Thank you very, very much. And sorry for the long, long time. Thank you, Fleur. Okay, Lewis, thanks for an excellent uh, presentation. And you can see you're a very passionate teacher. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so I'd like to yeah, have the panelists uh, uh, open it up to the panelists for questions or comments to Lewis. Okay, it's open now. Okay, just get off the screen share, Lewis. Just click on stop screen share if you'd like. Uh, there you go. Okay, questions and comments from the panelists, please. I see that, that my boss is here, Professor Leal. <laughs> Professor Roberto Leal that is here is one of the best neuroscale based surgeons in the world. He's from Brazil, he's from the north, northeast. No, not, not in the northeast, in the, in the sudest of Brazil. Well, welcome, welcome, Roberto. Welcome. Very experienced yes. surgeon, very experienced surgeon. He's a great Can man. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear yes. me? Yes, we can, can hear you. Hear. Can yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we are very concerned about radiotherapy indication for, uh, even for meningiomas, no? And uh, we come out with this uh, last presentation, last paper. It's, uh, it's from neurosurgery and it's May, and the, the title is Treatment of Asymptomatic Meningiomas with Radio Surgery. They call about the prophylactic treatments of asymptomatic meningiomas. What do you think about that, Luis? Even, oh, I can say that even the Lansford, no, criticized that article, no? You know, Roberto, uh, we know that radiation therapy works for many children. The, the tumor starts to grow slowly. But we, we don't know that the tumor will grow or not. The only curative treatment is the removal. I, I would say we are surgeons, but we are doctors, doctors of patients. We need to give the treatment the patient needs. Asymptomatic tumor. And the patient is perfect. Just a headache. Maybe fight with the wife. Now he has headache. Do an MRI. And fight something there. You go there and boom, burn the head. It's not this way. If uh, radio, radiotherapy for meningioma give time, radiotherapy for meningioma does not cure. Radiotherapy for the brain can be not good treatment. Radiotherapy for the tumor can transform. May, please give the treatment that the patient needs. Don't give the patient that you have to offer to the patient. It's my, my idea. If the tumor is growing, you cannot remove. Okay, give radiation therapy. It's okay. But does not mean that you start to see. I see here two giants of skull base. Professor Gerardo Guinto. Gerardo Guinto from Mexico. And my great friend and great surgeon, Professor Ibrahim, is big. Uh, see, two men here that uh, they, they, could, they know more than me of Skull Bay. I know if Beginto is here yet, and Professor Isbay was here. See. Hello, Dr. Borba. It's uh, actually Gerardo Ginto Jr. <laughs> oh, the, okay, the son. Yeah, the son. Tell her, tell her father yeah, that is. Thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Oh, okay. it's okay. You learn with the father. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Professor Ibrahim, you was here? Oh, is, is he? Is he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'm with you, and I thank you for your presentation. I know you are interested in these cases. We've met several times in skull base uh, surgery yeah. uh, sessions, etc. I know your experience in Petroclab and meningioma. 
I do support your opinion that surgery stands first in the management of these cases. I don't believe in the upfront uh, radiotherapy or radiosurgery treatment uh, because this will not offer a cure for the patients. However, having said that, one would classify them into either small tumors or larger tumors. Small tumors that are good for both the gamma knife or radiosurgery and surgery. But I tell you, it's very good for surgery, so why should I go for uh, radiosurgery in small cases? And in the large cases, you have to do surgery. And if and when you cannot remove the tumor completely, then the remnant would be given uh, radiotherapy or radiosurgery after a while, after proving that it is really increasing the price. So I do support your your approach to that uh, to that uh, formidable legion, which is the petroclavian legion. Right. Roberto. Yeah, uh, I'd like to say that the smaller ones are the easier ones to remove and to cure. And that's the, the, the best way, no? We cannot just send the smaller ones to the radio surgery. Well, um, I don't know if, uh, the small one in the area that you can remove, there is no other option than try to remove. But sometimes there is a small one the great example is the cavernocyte meningioma. Professor Ibrahim and Roberto know very well that during many, many years, a lot of people have talked about removal, total removal, removal. And Professor Dolink said that he, one, two years ago, I was, I was listening to him and he started the lecture saying, I apologize for the many patients around the world that I had, I, I left with some motility deficit. We know today that the natural history is more benign than seen. The question is, give radiation therapy in advance for this small cavernous sinus tumor, asymptomatic, or wait? My policy is to wait. I know that many people is giving radio surgery for them. I believe that the natural history of this tumor is a very slow, it sometimes grow so slowly that never in his entire life you have problem. You used to see very, very often patients is 75 years old, 80 years old, 70 years old, with a small tumor, the patient will die of another thing. The tumor is there. The meningioma, you never know the speed of the growth, the, the hate, um, the hate of growth, see? Because this, I always wait to send immediately, immediately to radio surgery. If I do surgery, I remove the maximum that I can. There is one area that I couldn't remove. I prefer to leave and wait. But I agree also, if give right for, radiotherapy for this situation, it's okay. It's okay, there is no, no very, not too much problem on this. My concern is this paper, if Roberto showed, that asymptomatic patient, asymptomatic patient, this patient has nothing. The patient maybe have a fight in, in the football game. The other day he has headache, do an MRI, do a CT scan and find a small calcified meningioma that never in the life will have a problem. Boom, go there and burn. It's, my, it's the point that Roberto want to bring. It's the point that we need. That's to it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I spoke too much. No, 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 no. no. I'm, sure, I'm sure there are more comments and questions. Any more comments and questions? Leaf, any questions, comments? And you have two giants here. Uh, I want to. Well, you know, Abraham, I'm, I'm very excited to have Professor Isbay here, one well, of the best skull based surgeons in the world. And, thank you. and Roberto, also our friend and great neurosurgeon. See, you have great people here. Actually, actually Louise, last week uh, I, and the week before, I presented the two subtypes of the cerebellopontine angle meningiomas versus the spitroclival meningiomas.
Yeah. And I'm a great believer in doing surgery for these cases and uh, leave uh, radio surgery or radiotherapy thereafter for the uh, patient who cannot go through surgery, who's yeah. unfit for, for surgery, or if you, as you said, if you leave a tumor there. I'm always concentrating on this point. It is the state of mind of the neurosurgeon who's doing this case. You go in with the state of mind that you want to remove the tumor completely is different from a neurosurgeon who's going there with the intention, with the state of mind, that I'm going to remove part of it and then give radiotherapy. So Woody this Becker. is... Um, yeah, I call, so I'm, I call Woody Becker surgery. Absolutely, absolutely. Woody Becker, uh, go there, bite, bite and go home. <laughs> The other point is that uh, on coming Wednesday, I'm presenting a rare case of, uh, of uh, abducent nerve uh, schwannoma, uh, which is a prepon time. So I hope that you'll join us on Wednesday. Good, good. What time will it be? It will be local Jordan time at 7 o'clock. I don't know what's your time, but uh, John Bennett will, will, uh, will put the times for you. Yeah, I'll let you know, Lewis. He, he, he gives a multidisciplinary presentation, not only a neurosurgeon, but he involves the anesthesiologist, uh, uh, car, uh, oncologist. Uh, they're quite good. Great, great. And you so hope, to, hope to see you all next Wednesday. <laughs> Professor. Thank see you very much. You're in China. I will be in China next week. Hope, hope no, not not in China, but I, I hopefully China will meet for the, you for the meeting. Somewhere. No, no, I'm not going for to China, but hopefully to meet you soon. Okay, maybe in Brazil, oh. March. In March, yeah. we have the Scout Base, the World Federation Scout Base meeting, will be in Rio. Yeah. Yes, March good. That, 25 yeah. to 28. You send me the information. I'm I'm happy to join. Yes, yes. You bring all okay. these young people here. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. It's a okay. pleasure. Uh, any more comments or questions from the uh, residents? Excuse me, Professor Barba, uh, thank you very much for your amazing lectures. Uh, very important for us, uh, your lectures, your lessons, your discussions. Uh, we, I, I remember you, you came last year in Tumen, Tumen for a skull base course, and uh, we are waiting for you uh, in this year, in October. Okay, prepare the case. Yes. Prepare the case, the food and the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto, Roberto also is going this year with us. Yeah, I will be there. I'll be there. Roberto is going. Roberto is going. Okay, excellent. Roberto has one of the largest experience in the whole Latin America in acoustic neuroma. Right. He has more right. than than one thousand one thousand. 1,000 oh, 1, uh, acoustic neuromas. He's right. a great surgeon, great surgeon. He'll wow. do a, a live surgery there in, in to me. In to super, me. super. Okay, okay, to me and after go to Banya. Please come to, <laughs> come to Russia, please come to Russia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he's going Thank first. I, I Professor, saw him lecture in Russia. He didn't let the residents sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Louis. Uh, and anytime you want to present, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay. And, and thanks all the uh, attendings, especially for coming out, and thanks for the neurosurgical residents. Yeah. It's going to be recorded, and we'll send it to everybody. So I'll sign off officially. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.